As humans who have physical bodies that are prone to injury or illness, we all sense if something is physically wrong with us by paying attention to any signs or symptoms like pain that may suggest that something is wrong. The usual thing that follows is a trip to the doctor for examination. That way, we can receive the appropriate treatment that would allow us to heal from whatever condition or illness we might be suffering from. Now, do we do this for our spirits also? Here's a question for you. Have you ever sat down and examined your spirit when something felt a little off? I mean, really, really reflected on the condition of your soul, the condition of your heart, of your mind. Why did that make me feel so angry? Where did those thoughts come from? What really caused me to feel so troubled? These are questions that we ought to be asking ourselves whenever we feel something that's contrary to the Word of God. Sometimes as Christians, we seem to live our lives as if all is well. And some of us can actually convince ourselves that we're happy. However, if we actually pay attention to what is happening on a deeper level, we would soon realize that there are all sorts of issues that need to be dealt with. Issues that cause spiritual infirmity. All of us should be sensitive to the signs in our lives that tell us we need healing. These signs manifest themselves in different ways. If we are objective, if we're honest, and if we truly examine ourselves against the standard of the Word of God, we'd begin to pick out, Oh, I have a heart issue. Someone hurt me and now I feel entitled to sympathy or attention. True reflection is when you sit down and notice, I have a mind issue. My thoughts right now are dirty and impure. And then as you dig a little deeper, you find that they are impure and dirty because you're spending so much time listening to music that talks of making love, having sex, and all kinds of things. That's what you're feeding your mind. And what you feed will grow. And as it grows, it becomes an issue. And these issues include bitterness, unforgiveness, grudges, and so on. Having any of these issues points to the fact that we need to be delivered from them. We need to be healed from them. You see, without inviting the Lord in for deliverance or healing, we are unable to mature or grow spiritually because we are stuck in a place of affliction and cannot possibly have joy in its true sense as Christ commands us to. True and lasting healing can only come from the ultimate healer, Jesus Christ. Should you find yourself always in regret or beating yourself up about past mistakes, that's a sign you need healing. Should you find yourself to always be getting angry at everybody who doesn't share your view or share your opinion, that's a sign that you need healing. If you find joy in putting others down or gossiping about others, that's actually a sign that you yourself need healing. These can all be issues of hurt, low self-esteem, or bitterness. All of these can only be healed by Jesus Christ. Oftentimes, when you find someone who can't forgive, someone who won't forgive, that person usually has wounds or scars that have been left unattended. Unforgiveness is a sign that a person needs healing in one or more areas in their own life. During Jesus' ministry, one of the main points he focused on was forgiveness. He taught his followers to pray by saying, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And so now for us as believers, we can be certain that forgiving others is not just something we can choose to do. It is something we must do 
And it would be disobedient to God if we were to be unforgiving towards others. But to what extent does God want us to forgive? How many times? Well, Peter asked Jesus the same question in Matthew 18, verse 21 to 22, which says, Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but seventy times seven. Now you might be thinking, why is God so insistent that we forgive people who hurt us? Why so many times, Lord? Seventy? Seven times? If they did it the first time, okay. But if they kept hurting me, why do I have to keep forgiving? Does the Lord not care about our pain? However, let me tell you, God wanting us to forgive is all about how much He cares for us. He loves us so much that He doesn't want us having any bitterness or resentment in our hearts because that would make our lives miserable. Bitterness, unforgiveness, and resentment festers in the heart and in the soul. It grows and corrupts you from the inside out. That's why I believe the Lord wants us to forgive so often and so freely. I believe that the Lord would also have us forgive so freely and often is because He also wants us to be like Him. Jesus, the Son of God, one who was blameless and pure, died on the cross and forgave us even while we were sinning against Him. So who are we that we shouldn't forgive others? When you harbor unforgiveness, this should be a sign to you that there is something unresolved within you because if you have received mercy from the Lord, why would you refuse to forgive others? If the Lord has forgiven you for all that you have done, then who are you to make the decision not to forgive someone else? I believe that unforgiveness is a sign you need healing from the Lord because you cannot expect to receive mercy but place yourself at a moral high ground when it comes to forgiving others. Take a good look at yourself. Is there anything in your life that is an indication that you need healing? Is there pain from your past that's unresolved? Is there regret from previous mistakes that has grown and grown into something else? Only the power of the blood of Jesus Christ can give you true and lasting healing. James chapter 1 verse 22 to 25 says, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. The challenge is to be a doer of the word rather than just hearing about God's word. Saints, when we go before God with a heart humbled and surrendered, that's where transformation can take place in His presence. It's a place where we can be honest about what we're lacking and where we need to improve. The quickest way to block God's blessing in our lives is to believe others owe us and expect payment from them. This is called unforgiveness, a subject with which I am well acquainted. And I would like to speak to you and give you my own testimony. I didn't understand why God blessed so many of my friends with loving, supportive families while they were growing up. And I had the opposite. 
I compared my situation in life to theirs and inwardly resented the fact that God had not given me the kind of support network that others experienced. Instead of focusing on what God had given me, I focused on what he hadn't. I went into collection mode. I tried to collect from others what I thought was due me. I tried to find in others the mother and father I never had. And I became brokenhearted all over again when others couldn't compensate for the losses in my life. Have you ever felt like that? Has life and disappointment ever taken you to a place where you look for things in people that you can really only find in God? Matthew 18 tells of a man who demanded that the ledger be set straight, forgetting that the divine accountant had credited him with far more mercy in the book of life than he could ever repay. The Bible says in Matthew 18, verse 26 to 30. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. The unforgiving man wanted to collect from someone who simply couldn't pay. Even if the fellow servant did have the resources, the unforgiving man was looking to people rather than trusting the Lord. Jesus went on to say that when the master of the unforgiving man found out he had treated a fellow servant so unmercifully when his own debt had been canceled, he threw the man into debtor's prison. Jesus said that unless we forgive, we will not be forgiven. As I read this, I realized how unjust I had become, how self-righteous I had become, how much like the unforgiving man I had become. I repented and asked my heavenly father to forgive me and help me forgive others. I stopped trying to collect from people what I thought was owed me, what I thought would make up for past hurts. As Hebrew 12 verse two says, I fixed my eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. The chapter right before that, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God loves to reward us. We're his children. He blesses us when we seek him first, not people. When we place our faith in him, not people. When we love him more than anything he can give us. Another hindrance to God's blessing in our lives is our thoughts. What do we think about? Do we control our thoughts or do our thoughts control us? Do we struggle with worry over finances and can't focus on anything else? Do we struggle with loneliness and can't find joy in our situation? Do we struggle with feeling trapped and are afraid we're losing control? Our Heavenly Father is so gracious. He sees you. He sees me. He sees our struggles and wants to help us with our thoughts. We can wake up in the morning and pray, Heavenly Father, please help me to meditate on your word today, to be thankful for your grace, for your love, for eternal life, for salvation through the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. Psalm 19 verse 14 says, May these words of my mouth And this meditation of my heart 
be pleasing in your sight, Lord, my rock and my redeemer. When I realized that Satan wanted me to believe that my thoughts were in control instead of me in control of my thoughts, it changed my mindset completely. I discovered that I could choose what I thought about, so I chose to think thankful thoughts. Thank you, God, for loving me. Thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for watching over me. Once I decided that I wasn't going to allow my thoughts to block me from the blessing of God's righteousness, peace, and joy in my life, I made a few drastic changes. For starters, I paid careful attention to what and who I listened to in my life. There were some TV shows I stopped watching. There were some news columns I stopped reading. There were some friends I stopped going to for advice. I learned to recognize what fed my faith and what fed my fear. My conversation started changing once my thoughts did. I no longer felt comfortable engaging in gossip, let alone listen to it. Then one day, when I was reading the book of James, I realized I had a big problem. My mouth. The third chapter of James showed me exactly why I wasn't experiencing God's blessings of righteousness, peace, and joy. James chapter 3, verse 9 to 11 says, With the tongue we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My mouth was a polluted well, and I didn't want to be that way anymore. I wanted to be a sincere believer in Jesus Christ, and that meant believing the entire word of God, not just the parts that were convenient for me. Whenever I spoke unkindly about a brother or sister in Christ, I was speaking unkindly about someone who Jesus died for, shed his blood for, gave his life for. Proverbs 18 verse 21 says, The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. I decided I had wielded the weapon of my tongue enough for a lifetime, and I was tired of eating that poisonous fruit. No, I didn't take a vow of silence. I still talked. Not nearly as much, though. I became a better listener and discovered that I learned far more from listening than talking. What we expect from God and others, what we think about, what and who we listen to, and what we say flows from one of two wells, a well of polluted water that hurts others and blocks the blessings of God, or a well of fresh water that is life-giving and full of goodness of God's righteousness, peace, and joy.